In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Forgiveness is the central message of today's sermon. I'm sure your pastor preached the same this morning and will do so this evening. We need forgiveness today. Forgiveness is absolutely necessary. If there's going to be peace in the world for which we've been praying this whole novena and we will continue to pray even beyond, it has to begin with forgiveness. The world doesn't understand forgiveness, though, does it? It doesn't be begin to comprehend what forgiveness could be. Politics can't comprehend that word, forgiveness. What do they seek in politics? Rank justice. But no matter of justice, no matter how great, no matter how perfect to be rendered out, can ever bring about peace. Justice never brings peace. Only forgiveness brings peace, because forgiveness issues forth from love. We'll say that again. It's worth noting. Only forgiveness brings about peace, because forgiveness issues forth from love. What love does, love converts an enemy and makes that enemy the member of one's own family. It makes one a beloved one, though formerly he were the enemy. Love lets go of evil, as St. Paul speaks in his great P, in his great poem of love, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. He says, love does not brood over injury. It doesn't brood over wrongs that have been done. Forgiveness is what brings families back together. Let's go to our mother. She's, She's the mother, mother of, of the human, human race. race, born in grace. Let's ask him for our family, for peace. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum. Benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Mary, Mother of Mercy, pray for us. Why is it that forgiveness is so important? What's so important about forgiveness? Why does the gospel promise eternal hell to those who refuse to give forgiveness? Seems a very serious charge, doesn't it? It's because of this, when we look closely at the gospel, not just the one for today, but all the gospels, the root of the gospel we find the entire story of salvation history is really the story of forgiveness. Isn't that the truth? It's the story of forgiveness, the whole of the gospel message. There's an author by the name of Rebecca Pippert, and she audited some Harvard psych classes. She was given the opportunity to go and to study for free, it seems. She took one particular course that was called Systems of Counseling. One of my majors was psychology. I understand these things. And in that course that she was given at that prestigious university, the professor gave many case studies on therapeutic methods to help people dig deeper and to find a sense of healing as far as they could go. Well, one case allowed a man to uncover a deep hostility and anger that he held within his soul unknownst to him against his own mother, which allowed him to better understand himself and how he was living out of those wounds in his life. Well, Rebecca Piper, this author, raised her hand in that class when she was able to ask a question and said, Professor, how would you have responded if the man had asked for help to forgive his mother? And he responded saying thus, Well, forgiveness... Forgiveness was a concept that assumed a moral responsibility, and as you see, scientific psychology can't speak to that. You have to remember, as a counselor, you cannot force your values of forgiveness upon your patients. She wasn't the only person in the class that found this idea of the professors to be unsatisfactory, and so there was great uproar within that Harvard classroom. Well, the professor, he wanted to calm everything down and thought he'd add a little bit of his own sense of humor in there to seek to do so. And so he finally said to them to relieve that tension, 
He said, listen, you guys, what you're looking for here is a change of heart. And I think you're looking in the wrong department if you're looking for a change of heart. Because forgiveness is divine. You got to go to the theology department for that. Isn't that a telling admission? A telling admission, is it not? This is why psychology always comes up short. It always comes up short. We are all actually looking within our lives, whether secular or religious, each and every one of us are looking for some way of a change of heart, but the world, it cannot offer this. Secular reasoning by itself cannot reach out to this end. It requires something which is divine to work. You see, that's the logic of the cross. The logic of the cross is all about forgiveness, which the world cannot grasp, though it is at the center of its longing. If you and I are going to understand the gospel today, we have to do something to understand the numbers that are here because to our Western minds, in our culture, the numbers don't really make a whole lot of sense. What is a talent? What is a denarius? What do these things add up to? What is 10,000 talents against 100 denarii? You don't know Mark Pius? Okay, well, I'll tell you, pay attention. One talent. One talent is equivalent of 6,000 denarii. That gives you some perspective, right? One talent, 6,000 denarii. What are 6,000 denarii? A denarius is one day's wage for a day laborer. So it's 6,000 days wages is one denarius. Do the math on that. Don't worry, I did it for you. If you allow for one day Sundays of rest, which you should always have, that adds up to 18 and a half years of work. One talent. For a day laborer, working his nails, working his hands out. What does that add up to in modern pay? Look this up. It said as of last month when they last gave these results, it was $42,000 a year is what a day laborer can expect to gain during his yearly work. That would mean that one talent, remember that's 6,000 days wages, 18 and a half years, would be a beautiful number. 777 thousand dollars it's a fun number right but this man didn't owe one talent did he now we got to multiply that by ten thousand which gives you seven thousand or rather seven point seven seven billion dollars that's a lot even when you compare that to the national debt that's a lot of money $7.77 $7.77 billion, 10,000 talents, 11 million days wages, or 18,500 years of work. Does that put things in perspective to you here? This is an impossible amount for anyone to ever promise to say, I'm going to be able to pay it off as a day laborer. It's impossible to be able to do so. Not even that great lottery winning would have paid exactly that. There's no way that this man could spend the entirety of his lifetime to be able to do so. In fact, the whole of human existence in human history, it probably wouldn't have been enough to be able to pay off that debt. And so what about that fellow servant who only owed a hundred denarii, a hundred days wages? Pocket change. Pocket change. Easily, this is something that one could pay back with frugality and hard work throughout the course of one's life. That's not a difficulty. But yet he refuses to forgive this debt, which was one million times less than what he himself was forgiven. The man said to the king, Lord, have patience with me. I will pay you back everything. And the king should have responded to him, Yeah, right. That's impossible for you to do throughout the course of your life. Go to prison, you, your whole family, and that won't even begin to make a dent in what you owe me. But instead, what the Greek says right there, the Greek word says that his bowels were moved with compassion. 
That means in the depth of his being, the king was rocked by his core to see that man down on his knees, groveling, knowing that there's absolutely no way that he could pay this back. And so, with this impossible debt, he forgave everything. And this man was willing to sell the wife and kids of that other man into slavery over a paltry sum. By the way, think about that for a moment. How could this man have accrued a debt of $7.77 billion? He's just a day laborer, remember? How could he be able to do so as a servant to get that much from a king? He quote-unquote borrowed it. And that's how he got it. He must have stolen it. That's the only way. He embezzled the money in some sort of way. He committed a crime in order to get it. The king could have thrown him in prison just for that alone, and yet he forgave the entirety of the debt. This is obviously an analogy that our blessed Lord Jesus Christ is using for us and God, our relationship, our divine debt, what we owe to divine justice. You see, every sin that you and I commit, every one of them is stealing from God, from the treasury of what God has given us in the human freedom which he has planted into each and every one of us to do good, to make a good return upon it. Every sin is not a borrowing from God, but rather it's something of theft. In fact, thievery is something that we do by negligence. But when we do it knowingly, when we do it willingly, when we do it openly, when we do it without care for consequence, when we say, I'm just a human being, I can't really be perfect, and we go ahead and do it anyway, brazenly, this is what we call the violence of robbery, which is a far, far worse crime because it's done out in the open without fear of consequence. 10,000 talents, 18 and a half years of labor for one of those. And that's what we steal from God with one single mortal sin. How many of us can say that we're guilty of only one mortal sin? Are we not rather brazenly adding up mortal sin upon mortal sin? How carelessly do we miss Mass or a holy day of obligation saying I have other things, other demands? How easily do we fall into self-pollution or those indiscreet internet searches? What about the wanton gossip so oft that murder the good name of other people? Each of these is a mortal sin. Each of these is another $7.77 billion in theft, another 18 and a half thousand years of work. And at the mercy of God, the mercy of God extends readily to forgive even our passing pleas for pardon. Just one moment of humility moves the bowels of compassion of our everlasting Father for us. Our brazen robbery of the generous tre treasury of God's gifts, just one ounce of self-recognition of how deeply we are indebted. In view of the enormity of what our sins deserve, which is hellfire, yet He forgives. The whole lot forever if you just walk into that confessional where Father is hearing confessions now, even if the light is red, it eventually turns green. Keep him in there. Make him work. Work for your salvation. And yet we hold grudges for a hundred days' wages, a hundred denarii, a mere $12,000. In doing so, we insult God's mercy. We bear a grudge, we exact the full amount, we fight over crumbs when a whole lifetime of sumptuous feasting is granted to us for free. How pitiable is our lot. How deserving of treatment of that wicked serv servant are we when we refuse forgiveness to others for whatever it is that they may commit to us in light of how greatly we offend divine majesty. This is what happens when we refuse to forgive our neighbor. And you see, God doesn't snap his fingers in an instant and say, totally forgiven, never think about it again. The $7.77 billion debt per mortal sin still has to be paid. The king has to swallow that loss himself in order to grant us forgiveness. And this he happily does. He happily does, but it costs him the cross. That's what it costs him. 
keep that incredible price before your eyes, upon your minds, when we approach here at the table of the Eucharist. This means that to break our hearts of stone when we realize what we've done. It's an interesting word that the king uses in this place. In the Greek it says, I forgive you all your debt because your hardness of heart. It says that in the Greek. And that's what the passion and death of our Lord is intended to do. It's intended to be a heartbreaking loss for us when we're exposed to it. So that our hearts of stone may find a way after being broken by seeing what he's done for us, for God's love, his mercy to enter in, to allow us to see our necessity, necessity, necessity to share that very same mercy with others. What are some examples for us to follow? We can think of our own Saint Stephen here, burying the implements of his own torture and death when his hand before us every time we come into the church. Saint Stephen is a patron who had mercy to forgive others even while they were stoning him. He said, Lord, do not hold their sin against them. We find this in the book of Acts. And as we say within the litany every Sunday night at Vespers, his heart of charity, his mercy, was harder than their hearts of stone, the stones which they threw upon him. Again, we think of Father's Novena to St. Maria Goretti that he gave, how she forgave Alessandro Salinari who attempted to deflower her. And although he murdered her, this young girl offered all of her suffering while she was suffering those three days to allow him the grace of forgiveness so that one day he would be recognized because it took root within his life. He will be a saint recognized by the church because of the mercy she worked on his behalf. Again, the great founder of the Jesuit order, St. Ignatius of Loyola, he once walked on his own feet 100 miles during the winter in order to nurse a sick man who just weeks before that had stolen all of St. Ignatius' meager earnings and spent them in a profligate way. Think of the great martyr St. Edmund Campion who was betrayed and arrested. And while he was still in prison, he was visited by that very same man who turned him over to the judge and betrayed him. Not only did St. Edmund Campion forgive the man who was his betrayer, but he also urged him to get out of England as fast as he could because they were coming after him too. He even wrote a letter while in that jail cell here on the way to his martyrdom to give him safe conduct if he would just hand this to a Catholic nobleman in Germany. How can you and I begin to practice this virtue beforehand? St. Philip Neri, the patron saint of my hometown, suggested that if we practice controlling our emotions, we can gain progress in this way. He gives us this action. He says, pretend within your mind, do a mental exercise in prayer that you've just suffered terrible insults and misfortunes within your life. Go to that place. Then he said, imagine yourself working to strive after Christ's example given us upon the cross by bearing these burdens with patience and charity. Walk through what that would feel like. Go through the motions mentally in your heart. And this sort of rehearsing, he says, will eventually make it easier for us to automatically respond in a more loving way when we actually feel affronts that people give to us. Again, St. Augustine notes to us, quote, there are many kinds of alms, the giving of which help us to obtain pardon for our sins, but none is greater than that by which we forgive from a heart of sin, a sin somebody has committed against us. So how do we go forward if we find within our hearts that we have absolutely no love for this particular person? How can we actually forgive them? The St. John of the Cross says this, were you to seek and to find a place where there is no love, then what you should do is pour love into that place. And then you will draw from that place love because you put it there first. Sometimes forgiving those who wrong us can set the stage for a miraculous miracles of grace. In fact, we see this in the 1400s. Saint Peregrine, that saint we re resort to in times of cancers. He wasn't always a saint. He was a very irreligious man in his youth and actually fought against the church. What the Pope had done, he sent St. Philip Benizi to mediate a dispute. 
And on the way, he was accosted by this young, future Saint Peregrine, who then, on his way, seeking to insult him all the more, struck him upside the face. What did this do to that strong man, Philip Benizi, sent by the Pope to go preach reconciliation? All he did was, following Luke chapter 6, simply turned the other cheek to the man. In doing so, so brazenly in the spite of what he did out of this man, he was immediately converted, St. Peregrine was, and repented, and later on became Catholic. That's why we have the great St. Peregrine that we have today. Again, St. Francis de Sales was intensely hated by a lawyer in his day, so much so that the man actually pulled out his own gun and tried to shoot him dead where he stood. Thanks be to God he missed. But he struck the priest that was standing right next to him. And so that man was rightly called before the judge on the account of murder, attempted murder, and convicted, sentenced to death was he. Yet Francis, however, pleaded on his behalf before the court. And so his death sentence was commuted. Yet even so, the lawyer never showed any bit of gratitude for the saint, but actually when he did so, the moment he was free, spat in the face of that blessed bishop. And how did the saint respond to this? We have his words recorded. The saint responded, quote, I have been able to save your soul from human justice, my friend. But unless you change your dispositions, you will fall into the hands of divine justice from which no power will be able to save you. What St. Francis shows us that the fact that somebody may not accept our offer of forgiveness does not excuse us from the obligation of extending it to him anyway. In fact, St. Sacred Scripture teaches us in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 through 17, saying that unforgiveness may forfeit our salvation. These are the words of Scripture. St. Paul says, Make every effort to live at peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will ever see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up in your heart to cause trouble, for it so easily defiles many. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights to the, as the eldest son. Afterwards, as you all well know, when he wanted to inherit his blessing, he was rejected. Even though he sought the blessing with tears, he could not change what he had done. End quotation of scripture. Forgive all you still can. Forgive all it's still possible that you may be ready when God commands your soul to give account before him of the way in which you practice mercy after his own example. Because no measure of tears will change what you have done when you arrive on that day. It's not easy for us to forgive. Certainly it is not. Anger is a very powerful emotion, and many of the saints throughout their lives struggle with this advice, even seeking revenge upon others. But asking divine help, they receive the grace to overcome all these feelings, to overcome themselves. You remember St. John Galbert. We spoke about him earlier this year. We had a beautiful pl play during our festival days given to us by the Chesterton Academy. What did it display? St. John Galbert, his brother Hugh was murdered by one who pretended to be a friend. And so John swore up and down before all that with every fiber of his being, he would have his vengeance. So one day he stumbled upon his enemy in a narrow passage that allowed no room for, a mistake, for escape. And so he drew his sword and charged him down. The man being unarmed could think of nothing but to do but to drop to his knees, beg forgiveness, and he put himself in cruciform. And at that, when he was ready to run him through, John Galbert stuttered. He sheathed his sword, embraced his enemy, and began to pray for him because that day happened to be Good Friday, and he had just left the Good Friday service. He said these words to him. He said, I cannot refuse what you ask me in God's name. And so I grant you your life, and I give you still more my friendship. 
on the condition that you would pray for me to God, that he might forgive me the sin which I have held in, against you. St. John Galbert, he immediately repaired himself to the church to pray and to weep over his many sins of holding this grudge in his heart for so long. And miraculously, what did happen? The crucifix bent its head down toward our future saint in recognition of John's sincere repentance and forgiveness of his enemy. John Galbert, like every person who has ever made heaven and still everyone who ever will, he came to realize the absolute essential need to forgive your enemies while still in this life. Because note this, Christ will reign only in a heart that seeks and strives after peace. Christ can only reign within a heart that seeks and strives after peace. Here's something what I do. I often give it in the confessional. Maybe you've heard it. If you want to practice charity in your heart forgiveness and you don't know the way to do so, pray the Hail Mary a little differently when you pray your rosary. John Paul II urges this. This is not something I'm making up. When you pray that last part, we say, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. You change it slightly. Say, pray for us. Pray for me and this person. Who are sinners now and at the hour of our death? By mentioning that person by name, you begin to have that mercy as you're praying for them and for you and for that relationship to be healed, which it can only be done by God, begging Our Lady to join you in that. God can deny her nothing. When you do something like that, God will move your heart to forgive from your heart as is required for salvation in the gospel. A couple final messages on forgiveness. St. Augustine says, if you are suffering a bad man's injustice, Forgive him, lest there be two bad men in their place. Again, St. Francis de Paola says, Pardon one another so that later on you will not remember the injury. The recollection of an injury is in itself wrong. It adds to our anger, it nurtures our sin, and it hates what is good. That unforgiveness, it is a rusty arrow and poison for the soul, and it puts virtue to flight. Finally, the words of the saint of yester, of last week, St. Teresa of Avila. She says, I cannot believe that a soul which has arrived so near to mercy itself, were she to know what she is and how many sin God has forgiven her, should not instantly and willingly forgive others and be pacified and wish well upon everyone instantly who has injured her because she remembers the kindness and the favors that our Lord has shown her, whereby she has seen proofs of exceedingly great love, and she is glad to have an opportunity offered her to show the great gratitude which God has shown her. So she shows it to this one in view of her Lord. Our Lord desires to grant you and I such a grace of forgiveness. Beseech it. And for those moments which you beheld it, there it is, the confessional. Go and beg forgiveness that you may have forgiven in this life. See to yourself that the doors of heaven be opened wide to those who seek and strive after peace, which is only earned in this life through forgiveness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.